Today, I want to talk about the overcoming life. And we want to start by looking at a passage of Scripture. If you've got your Bible right now, I want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm looking right now at verse 17. And here, I'm reading from the King James Version. The Word of God reminds us here, Therefore, remember the word therefore. Therefore, it's always about the time you come to a point of conclusion. The time of a point where you come to something that's very important to conclude something. And the Word of God says, Therefore, if any man... Being Christ. Keyword, in Christ. And the Word of God reminds us He is a new creature. Some version translates it as a new creation. But the King James Version talks about being a creature before God. That all things, all things are passed away. Behold, the Word of God says, new things are come. And this is so important. Because this is one of the product of the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. At the cross of Calvary, I need you to understand something. He said that you're totally changed. You're already totally, absolutely, completely changed. And you have been changed. Sometimes you don't understand this. And let me just say this. Just remember the word, I'll talk more about this. You have been completely changed. And all the old things are supposed to be gone. New things are supposed to be here. But the key word is in Christ. Now I remember when I first got saved again. Saved out of the world, saved out of my worldly ways. I struggled. I struggled because I knew I was still the same person after that. After the initial joy of sensing God's love for me, and after the initial joy of even being baptized by the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, and there was a great excitement in my life, but yet, every morning when I wake up, I'm still the same person. Every morning, I'm still the same person. And when Lord led me to this passage of Scripture, I struggled with it. God, I am still the same person. What all this talk about being a new creation altogether? I'm still having the same problems. I still wake up in the morning sometimes feeling that I just don't want to wake up. And you know, sometimes I look at it and I say, God, this world hasn't changed. This world hasn't changed. There's still the problems. There's still the issues. When you go to work, you still have issues to face. Even in the morning when you get up, hmm, before you even completely wash up and change, you're really issues in the house sometimes too. I know you all are. don't have those issues. Amen. But I struggled. And I said, God, what then can I do? And interestingly, the Lord led me to another passage of Scripture. And in this passage of Scripture, and I'm looking at John chapter 16, verse 33. And the Word of God reminds us, He says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Boy, I begin to realize something. Actually, what the world needs now is really peace. Because we are constantly in a stage of turmoil, constantly in a stage of uncertainties, constantly in a stage of sometimes confusion. And you know, fear, I've got so many come to me. Fear comes in so many ways. Fear of problems with the health, fear again of finances, fear again of relationships, fear, fear, fear. And we can wake up so fearful that some people say to me, I don't feel like waking up at all. But yet the Word of God tells us that when God created this world, every time He created, He saw it and He said, it's good. And finally, when he created man, he looked and said, it is very good. And I thought, well, if I get saved again, everything should be, borrow expression, hanky-dory, everything should be very good. But yet, there was these issues. Then these words said, in me you have peace. Then he said, 
in the world you have tribulation. <laughs> well, first when I read that, I didn't like that. I said, God, what are you trying to say? I thought you already redeemed this world. I thought you already saved this world. I mean, how come we have tribulation? And Lord stopped me. He said, I paid the price at the cross to redeem you. I could see the finger of the Lord saying, you. I said, yeah, but uh, now I'm a new creature. The whole world should be all falling in line. Then he paused. The Lord says, but I didn't redeem the world yet. Not that he will not redeem the world. He, did not, he has not redeemed the world yet. He has redeemed us. That we are believers him. That we can be his representatives here. To manifest his glory. To manifest even the coming redemption of this fallen world. But in this world, Jesus said, you will have tribulation. Amen. In fact, yesterday I was visiting one of the DG groups and this was an interesting discussion. You know, Jesus said, have you not met some people who don't seem to have any problems in life? Right? They seem to be so peaceful. They seem to... But you see, the reality is, we always look at the outward. Some people may be so happy and everything, and they seem to have finances, they seem to be, whoa. In fact, the psalmist said something, when I look at the wicked and how they prosper, my heart was really troubled. <laughs> and that's the word of God. There's tribulation, but yet some people seem to be, and they're wicked people, they're doing all the wrong things, they're drinking, they're smoking, they're gambling, they're doing everything, and yet they seem to prosper. Have you met people like that? Yes. But you see, the psalmist didn't so stop there. He said, it's when I entered the sanctuary of the Lord, and when I saw the final outcome, what happened to them, and what was laid up for me in store, he said, I can only stand and say, praise the Lord. Amen. You see, look at somebody right now. I want you to understand, and I'll be talking about this, the significance and the destiny that God has for everyone next week. Look at them and say, God has a plan for your life. Amen. And Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 says, The plans are of good and not of evil plans to give you hope and a future. But often we are in life today and we look at the plans that we have. It doesn't seem to be good. In fact, a lot of things, evil things seem to be happening. And I'm sure some of you will say, God, what's happening? I don't have the future and hope. And when every day I wake up, I see to see only hopelessness. Helplessness. But here Jesus said, but be of good cheer. Why? And here's the key word. I have overcome the world. You see, when Jesus came, he came as a normal person. He came, although conceived of the Spirit of God, born of a virgin woman, but he lived 30 years of life as a normal person. I believe he had his bad days, he had his scripts, he went through growing up from a boy. I'm sure there were bruises, there were people, who, classmates who were teasing him. And, you know, he had to go through life like this. But yet, the key word he said, I have over come the world. And he's trying to set an example for us that we can also overcome. What is really the word overcome mean talking about? And I realized as I mulled about it, thought about it, that overcoming is about winning. <laughs> it's about a victory that God has for us. Somebody shout amen. It's about winning, it's about the victory. Because when you overcome, definitely you have won something. Definitely you have a victory. And so I said, God, why am I not having this victory in my life? In fact, at one point of time, during the Asian economic crisis, oh, faith seemed so weak and victory was lost. And I became part of the world trying to run business, trying to think, and resorting to things of the world, going to the banks to borrow money, to everything else. And very soon, I was up to my eyeballs in debt. And you know what? 
Not only that was end, I was boring just to pay interest. Until the Lord convicted me about the word of God that a borrower is a servant to the lender. And if you're a servant to somebody else, you can't be a servant for God. And that was my struggle. And so in my struggle, I said, God, what do I have to do now to overcome? Have I got to be a better person? Boy, did I try. I strived and I strived and I strived. I tried to spend hours, alarm clock set early in the morning to wake up because Mark 1.35 told me that Jesus wake up early in the morning before the break of dawn and there he went to a quiet place and there he prayed. So I said, God, I've got to do it. And I strived. How many striving? <laughs> alarm clock got up. Oh, then I realised why Jesus had to go out, get out and go to a quiet place because I sat to sit on the bed and pray. Wow, always... <laughs> And I had to go up. Sometimes I had to go downstairs to my living room and sit there and don't do anything just in the cold, you know, trying to stay awake and try and talk to God. I thought I was not good enough. I tried to do everything. I tried to go fasting. I, I mean, I really tried to fast. I fasted one day. Mm. Still didn't work, fasted two days, still didn't work, fasted three days. I even went to five days, I went to 10 days. And even when I was convicted, I went to 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, lost 26 pounds or more than that, you know. But still, I was striving and I was not getting anywhere. In fact, I was feeling more and more condemned. <laughs> I just felt I was not good enough and I kept on trying. Until the Lord asked me one question. What do you think is the source of victory for you in being able to overcome? I said, my faith in you, God. And then I realized faith is something so often talked about and often challenged, but yet so little understood. And when God led me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 again, it says what? Now, therefore, faith is the substance of things hoped for, yet the evidence of things not seen. So I try to grapple with this. Faith is what? The substance of things hoped for. And I took this substance to say that my substance is my hope. So I tried to engineer my hope. How many of you tried this? I wrote down even what my hopes were. I tried to craft my hopes so that I can align my life to these hopes. And I say, my hope is so important because in this hope, I can overcome. In this hope, I will have victory. Until I realized it didn't get me anywhere at all. Because, you see, faith is always something about now. But faith is always based on hope. But the key is the substance is not about your hope. The substance in He who is the source of your hope. Let me say amen to that. It took me a long time to work it out. I hope it doesn't take you as long as it did me to work it out. That God has to be that substance. That the word of hope must come from God and not from my own desires, not my own feelings, not about what my ambitions are, not about anything, but God must be the source. And how do I get to the source of God Himself? And the first thing I understood God brought me to Revelation, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word is God. Oh, so I said, oh boy, I could do more Bible study. And I tell you, I plunged myself to Bible study and Bible study and Bible study, and I realized there's 7,487 promises here in this Word of God. Oh my goodness, how much memory work I got to do to write, try and remember the 7,487 promises. Oh, there's so much things to do. Oh boy. And I became a workhorse. Bible study became one of the center points. I set time, I set everything. I got to study the Word of God. But I began to realize after a while, the more I knew, the more I realized how little I knew. <laughs> you see, studies can bring you to one point where you can go to a point where you think you have arrived because you know everything. But I realized all of a sudden, the more I know about God, the more I realize 
how little I understood. Because here I am coming with my own finite mind, my own striving and my own sense of achievement to try to understand this infinite God. This God is not limited by time, matter or space. This God who says, one day, your one day, 24 hours, to him is, can be a thousand years. And a thousand years can be to him like one day. I said, my God, this is very, what is this? Uh, because you see, God is not limited by time, space, or matter as we are. And this is where I said, God, then how? There's only 24 hours. I, I can only study the word so much. I still got work to do. I still got, and there was this struggle. And then now, all of a sudden, God introduced some new spiritual disciplines to me. One of them was, you got to internalize the word. Wow, try to memorize the word. You got to meditate. Oh yeah, God. Oh, okay. You know, I won't go do the spiritual discipline, but I was laboring, I was trying. Until the Lord led me to something to understand. What really is the source of our victory that God has preserved for us as an overcomer in Jesus Christ. And he led me to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. And here was the story. King Saul had been told to go and go to war, things that he was supposed to do. And one of the things he was supposed to do was to destroy the Amalekites, to kill them, everything else, to destroy everything, all the animals, everything. And Saul took the victory as God said he would. He became victorious, defeated the Amalekites. Hmm. But here comes down the human part. He looked at everything and said, hmm, I must be forming alliance. So what he do? He didn't kill the king of the Amalekites. He took King Agak as a prisoner instead. He looked and said, wow, all these sheep, all these cattle, all these fatlings, all these things. Wow. What a waste to destroy them. So he began to gather what he calls the best. Best of this, best of that. And he was driving them back to Israel. And all of a sudden he met Samuel. And Samuel was being tell him, why do I hear all these bleeding sound of animals and everything else? You know? And did you do what God asked you to do? Oh, Samuel could, I mean, Saul could say, yes, we had a victory, God was right, blah, 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 blah. But yet, he was obedient. Obedient in doing what God asked him to do, yet, but in disobedience, in coming to the final conclusion to complete what he had to do. And that was when in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29, Saul was reminded of something and also the strength of Israel will not lie or repent. The strength of Israel, understand, for he is not a man that he should repent. Wow, that word first struck me. The word strength there was in capital. The strength is not about a thing. The strength is not about your ability. The strength is not about how strong you are, how clever you are. The strength is about a capital, a person. And Saul was reminded by Samuel that his victory was not because of his own strength, but strength as a person. And really that person is God himself. And you must understand this. That strength as God that Samuel was talking about, first again, it's a person. It's not just a thing. It's not just about a matter. It's about God Himself who gives the victory in the final outcome. And the source of all things, is what the Lord spoke to me, must be God Himself. And it will be, I had to understand something, not by strength, your strength or my strength, not by might, your might or my might, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that was the first revelation to me. What have I been doing? I've been striving. No, don't get me wrong. I was trying to do all the good things. Bible study is good. Meditation word is good. Internalization word is good. Fasting is good. Praying is good. 
But I was striving in my own strength. I was striving in my own abilities. And indeed, you see, this strength is not about a thing I believe in. It's not about my own experiences. It's not about what matters to me. It's about God as a person and what He wants to accomplish through us. And I want you to tell you something. It took me some time to work this out. And when God led me to Philippians 4.13, here I'm striving. And all of a sudden, this word came true to me. And Paul said, I can do all things to Christ who strengthened me. I can do all things. And all of a sudden, this hit me all of a sudden. The source of my ability, the source of my overcoming, the source of my strength to even accomplish it, I must realize it's about Jesus Christ. It's not by our own strength. In fact, the Word of God reminds us it's in our own sense of, no, not strength, but in our weakness. is God's strength then perfected in us. Wow. Then we get to understand what Jesus said something. If any man would come after me, let him first deny himself. You see, the denying of self is something that's very tough. Because every morning we get up, touch yourself. That's self. <laughs> the physical man wakes up. In the physical man is your body, your flesh. In the physical man is your, all your senses, what you see through your eyes, hear, smell, taste, touch. In this, you are alive in your five senses, affecting and being affected by the world. Yeah. And what is your strength? In fact, most of us, when we wake up, every morning, the old man wakes up with us. Every night before we go to sleep, we nail him to the cross. <laughs> every morning we get up, the old man get up too. And we are still the same person. But yet the Bible says, all things have passed away. New things are here. And I realized something. God, I got it all wrong. Because I have been trying to do things, setting myself in the center. And victory is not something from us. Not something that I can accomplish, I can do. It's not about experience of myself. It's about that very divine person of God. It is not a matter about what we are, what we have. Not about where we stay. God is no respecter of person, not just because you stay in a big bungalow, because you drive a nice Mercedes. As far as what God sees, God sees you from inside out. We often look at people from outside and we don't, are not able to look in. So we are influenced by the outside. And I begin to understand. That's why the victory was not there. The victory will not lie, the victory will not repent because the victory is based on the strength. And that was a point in my life that all of a sudden I began to say, God, now I've got to learn something. I got to begin to think and praise you because first I understand the living, the victory is in you as a living person from whom I can draw strength. Somebody shout Amen. It took me years to work this out. I pray that it won't take you the same time. <laughs> and I want to say something. The first characteristic, that, if you read the Bible, there are so many characteristics of how we can live that overcoming life in Christ. But the first characteristic of this life, today I just talked about this, is that it took me some time to understand that at the cross of Calvary, the divine exchange was done. We sang the song. We can sing songs and we can have notional ideas, but yet we do not understand the reality of it. The divine exchange has already been done at the cross of Calvary. You are, as a believer, who you are today, not because of anything more you can do. And I had to relook. Why? Well, I've been trying to change myself. 
And I want to make this statement right now. Write it down. The overcoming life is about an exchange life. Not about you trying to change your life. Let me repeat this again. The overcoming life begins when you understand this. It's about an exchange life. When Jesus went to cross, He exchanged His life to give it to you. And you say, oh, but how can I take His body? Wait, wait, wait. Let's get this concept right first. He has paid the price. He exchanged His life for your old defeated life. First, bear this in mind. Huh? <clears throat> he exchanged it all. That now if, if I say, but actually when you're a believer, you're already in Christ. <laughs> Why is that if? Because we have not settled the ifs and the buts and the maybes in our life. We must understand the Word of God is God. The Word of God will not lie or repent. The Word of God is about a total manifestation of God and not just in a dead letter. It's not just in your limited understanding of this Word. It's about a total revelation of God wanting to reveal Himself because He has already transformed you. You were darkness. You didn't say only you were in darkness. You were darkness. When darkness is there, there's an absence of light. Spiritual darkness is there when there's an the absence of God. Just remember this. And when God paid the price, the divine exchange, you are already not just in His marvellous light. You are already His marvellous light. That's why He said, you are the light of the world. Jesus came as a true light that you can be and will be and shall be and must be the light of the world. Why are we still going back to darkness? Why are we trying to switch on the light? Do you know when the light is there? The light has no struggle. Darkness cannot overcome the light. When you bring a light into darkness, what happens? You don't hear the darkness trying to say, no, 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 no. You just walk in and the light floods and darkness recedes. First perspective. They exchange life. It's the very life of Jesus today in you. Does the devil know that? Of course he knows that. That's why one of the weapons of the devil is the key weapon, deception. He wants to deceive you that you do not know who you are in Christ. He wants to deceive you that you don't understand that at the cross... Every promise of God when Jesus hung there was already settled, signed, sealed, delivered. At the cross, I want you to understand and hear this. The Word of God says, by His stripes, you are healed. Matter translated, you are already healed there. Well, we are still walking in sickness. We are still walking in imperfections. Because we are in an imperfect world that yet waiting for the manifestation of the sons of glory. Amen. Who are the sons of glory? You and I are. We are the redeemed of God. The world is waiting for the manifestation where we can bring the very presence of God in our lives into this world. And I want to tell you this. Change is coming. But we are not the instruments of change. We are there as a representation of God Himself because of the divine exchange. It took me a long time to work out the divine exchange, but God, I'm still feeling that does not matter how you feel. What does the Word of God say? And this meaning of this thing, God led me to Galatians 2.20. And I want to keep shouting this so you get it in mind. We are not changed, but we are exchanged. Let me repeat again, we are not changed, but we are exchanged. You all look still a bit thing. Okay, turn to me to Galatians 2.20. You see, at the cross of Calvary, <clears throat> I'm going to start preaching a message of the cross very soon. 
because I've never heard good messages on the cross preached and we have not understood the message of the cross. You see, at the cross of Calvary, Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified. Paul understood it. I am crucified with Christ. When Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago, I want you to personalize it to understand. I am crucified with Christ. Not I will be crucified. I may be crucified. I am crucified. As far as God is concerned, when Jesus hung there on the cross, it's as good as you were there hanging on the cross. You, Paul said, I am crucified. Personalize it. And because of the crucifixion, there is a divine exchange. It's no longer I delivered. See, you don't know things? It's no longer I delivered. But it's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. Are you still living in the flesh? Hmm. Are you still struggling in the flesh? Hmm. But because of this divine exchange, and you, you got to understand this to work this out. When Christ hung the cross, at the cross of Calvary, you were as good as being hung there with Him. And the exchange already done, that you can say it's no longer I that live. Now you have a newness of life. Christ brought the newness of life. And who lives in you right now? Christ lives in you. The reality, your body has become a holy temple of, uh, temple of the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul said. And because your body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit, understand this, you are no longer your own. Amen. If you believe in Jesus, not only are you a new creation, all things pass away, all things have become new. Your body has become a temple of the Holy Spirit and you are no longer your own. Because of the divine exchange, you cannot live the life that you lived before. You cannot do the things that you have done before. It's not because you're trying to work out to change yourself. And I'm trying to develop this so that you all catch it. It's not that we are now having to work to change ourselves. It's really the exchange has been done. But we have to learn how to walk in that newness of life. Do not allow the old things to come back. The devil saying, if I can deceive him, if he does not know what is a divine exchange, I can keep him from walking in the newness of life. I can keep him in the flesh. I can keep him with lust. I can keep him with temptations. I can keep him with ambition. I can keep him in the I, 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 me, and mine. You're no longer your own. Why is that the I, me, and I? That's what the Bible's trying to say. If Christ died for you, you are really no longer your own. The I must die. So any man want to come to me, let him first deny himself. There is a need of denial to understand that the old nature is already crucified at the cross. Don't allow the devil to lie to you. Don't allow devils to tell you, ah, maybe God's word is not true. When God paid the price, it's true. Finish. Accomplish. I had to work this out. Who am I in Christ? I'm still the old person feeling, no. There is exchange has been done. There's something now I got to work out that God has paid the price for newness of life, but how do I walk in the newness of life? There is nothing I can do to change myself. That's what God said to me. So stop striving. Stop trying. Amen. He even led me to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. When the word of God says this, he put Adam, put Adam in the garden to dress and keep it. And then when I studied the word put, it's not about positioning, putting man there. The word put actually is the Hebrew word yonaf. And yonaf means, translated properly, he made man to rest in the garden to dress and to keep it. There's work. But you say he made man to rest. And you and I will say, oh, very confusing. God wants me to rest. I want to go to paradise to rest. And he said, that's work. Until the Lord showed me. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6. There therefore remains a rest for the people of God. When you enter the rest, what happened? You will cease from your own works. You see, we are still trying to work things out. We're still trying to strive. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying fasting on the way. In fact, Jesus said, didn't say if you fast, he said when you fast. He didn't say if you pray, he said when you pray. Amen? But he says what? That's the key. We need to understand that we are not fasting to change ourselves. We are not fasting or praying to change ourselves. We are, should not be striving. We can do nothing to change ourselves. We could have done nothing to save ourselves. That's why Jesus Christ has come. Our blood shed a thousand times doesn't get you saved. I want to hear this. And this must come in. There is nothing that we can do, not on our own understanding, not on our own strength. The victory that God has for us in an overcoming life is understanding He is the source. He is the strength. He is the one that has already paid the price and there has already been an exchange. So I want you to hear this. You got to learn to start living now the exchange life. Amen. Stop trying to change your own life. Okay, and it's exciting. And we must understand in this exchange time, our life is no longer in the realm of I. Can you touch yourself? That's I, right? It has nothing to do with us anymore. It's not an evil I that's being changed to a good I by what we do. I'll repeat this again. It's not about an evil eye. I mean, we've got a lot of evil things, right? Being changed into a good eye. It's not about this filthy eye that I wake up with every morning with all the nasty thoughts and everything. Being changed into a clean eye. Just in the exchange life, understand. It's no longer about I. It's about Christ who liveth in us. Look at somebody, it's no longer about I. I want you to get it in. Not about I, me, my. If nothing you remember about this message, just remember, the exchange life has got nothing about I, me, or my. Not about my desire, or about what I want. Not about what I want to see the change in my wife, in my husband, in my family. It's about Christ in me. The greatest mistake, second one I want to tell you, that I realize is we think that victory requires process. So we are in the process. If you're not careful, we're working for the salvation. I want you to hear this. It doesn't require a process. There is a process of sanctification as you walk the newness of life. True. But the change, so to speak, has really happened at the cross. Nothing you do, nothing you deserve, nothing you can add to it. You have now, repeat, a exchange life. It's not about you anymore. Nothing that you can do can help change. You don't have to say, I'm in the process of working it out. Yes, true. Walk in newness life. Not in the process of working to change myself. I know it's going to be a, a tough thing for you to change your mind because we are trained in this world to be people of works. Amen. We don't seem to realize that we are working even for our salvation. Word of God doesn't call you to work for your salvation, but out of your salvation come the works of salvation for God. Difference, huh? You're not working for, but out of what God has done comes a walk in the newness. And I want you to hear this. Just because you feel there's the absence of the process of change in life, don't think you have defeated. We got to change our mentality. Stop thinking defeated mentality. Don't keep saying, 
Hi, I cannot. I cannot. You need a reset in your mindset. I'll shout this again. You need a reset in your mindset. Wow, many of us still got old mindsets. Now we should have a new mindset, the mind of Christ in us. Part of exchange life is the mind of Christ. Don't keep thinking in the old mindset. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. That is positive thinking that the world teaches you in management classes. I want to tell you something I can today. Not because I think, because I know I'm the new creation right now. I have the exchange life. I only need to understand this so the devil doesn't steal it. Who am I in Christ? Amen? Not if you're in Christ. I need to know who I am in Christ. How do I now begin to walk in that newness of life? Our life has been exchanged. And I want to tell you this. You think that everything will be well if we can control our temper, if we don't lose our temper? You think, well, because I can pray, I can spend time with God? We think that just because we have all these things, we can overcome. We have to remember that victory has nothing to do with us. We have no part to play in the victory that's already been done for us. But we got to learn to, and keyword, okay, I will talk more about this next week, that this life is not about attaining it. It's about obtaining it. We are still trying to attain a standard. But yet we have not understood how we can position ourselves in court to appropriate and to obtain what is already done. Amen. That's why we're always working because we're trying to attain. You know, I'm sharing this with you because it took me a long time to work it out. I'm still trying to attain. I'm still trying to strive. No. We've got to learn to do it by resting in Him. Resting means, doesn't mean you don't do work. You need to understand how He wants you to do it. Even if you want to share Jesus with somebody. Remember why we pray. Because we need God to give us the wisdom to lead us how to share. Right? Yep. Remember, yep. you go there, huh? oh, must convict the guy. Brother, if you don't accept Jesus, you go to hell. <laughs> I want to tell you this. God does not want to give you a spirit of bondage of fear. But we come to God because of love that He first loved us. When we're yet sinners, He died for us. Today, we can say we love Him because He first loved us. Exchange. If nothing else, I keep repeating because yeah, I want you to take away from today's sermon. I have an exchange life. Nothing I can do to victory of Christ has nothing to do with us. You know, I still remember one time in the counseling, somebody came to me. Now, I have never found after I reflect on this, this person was one of the most difficult cases I ever went through. And she would not listen to me. She spent two hours trying to tell me how difficult it is to overcome. She said, I've studied your Bible. I've listened to all the Bible study. I'm trying to overcome, but I cannot overcome. From the time she was a young person, she had issues, she cannot overcome. She's now 50 years old, still cannot overcome. Same issues is still haunting me. And, you know, she couldn't overcome her pride, couldn't overcome the temper. Every time she tried, oh, she was failed and defeated each time. You know, let me tell you this, don't, don't get me wrong. She had a desire to overcome. But she could not overcome. Why? Because she found it impossible to overcome. Not by anything she could do. So I was saying, God, now this is a very unique case. I have a person who really wants to overcome. And she's one of them, but yet she could not. She had grieved over her failures. She talked about failures two hours, talking over and over about all things, and even sharing me how she attempted suicides a few times because she found no more hope in life. 
She had no more objective and direction in life. She only felt helplessness, hopelessness, and she come to a point of total discouragement and was on the brink of even going into deep depression. Hmm. So when she was listening to all this for two hours, I was patiently listening. I learned a lesson there. Sometimes you've got to interrupt people and stop them being so negative. But this was in the early days, and I have not yet learned how to take authority to <laughs> into certain things. So for two hours, I listened. And then all of a sudden, the Lord spoke something in my heart. This is a good candidate for me. I said, good candidate for God? For what? He said, I'm Dr. Jesus. I have the perfect clinic waiting for her to come in. And also I realized, here I was trying to work through my mind, how can I help this woman? How do I help her with the depression? How do I help with this discouragement? How do I give her a sense of helplessness, ho uh, hope, and everything else? But I want to say something today. Thank God that there is good news. <laughs> the good news is that the overcoming life is not about change, but an exchange already done. It's not about whether Christ has overcome. If you overcome, then there's no glory for God. But because you overcome, what happened? You can embrace the glory, you can embrace that victory, and you can learn. So I want you to hear this next thing in my heart. Victory is not about overcoming by yourself. It is about Christ overcoming for you. And remember, I quoted Galatians 2.20, and to understand it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives me. God's way is one of replacement. That's why when I look at the Bible, I studied it. You know, he doesn't say, I give you, I change the ashes. No, he didn't change the ashes. He gave, replaces it with a beauty. Isaiah 61, verse 3. He does not change your mourning that you can mourn less. Amen. What does he do? He replaces the mourning with the oil of gladness. He replaces. He doesn't work things out progressively. You must understand the replacement he wants to do in your life. God's way is never to change, but he's here to exchange. I'll repeat this again until it gets into you. God's way is never just to change. He wants you to understand the exchange. Now, I want to thank God for one thing, that we are not able to change ourselves. <laughs> and we need to understand this between a change and exchange. Okay, in the papers, we saw recently this man who bought a new Mercedes. Was it Mercedes? Ah. A BMW, okay, sorry. No, okay, okay. And he had so much complaint because he didn't like the noise and everything else. And he keeps sending the car and the car spent more time in the workshop. And the car spent more time in the workshop not because they're working and because he refused to take the car until they rectified all the faults. And they tried and they tried and they tried and tried. Actually, it's because he got so high standards to attain. Correct? And what he won really was not about them trying to repair and change what was wrong. He wanted it to be replaced with a new car. <laughs> I'll tell you this, that is a problem today in the world. But God has no problem. God has got so many new cars, He wants to exchange it. He doesn't just want to repair it. And I won't tell you, you can do everything to repair it, repair it, repair it, and the repair will be according to your own personal ability to handle it. We must come to a point to realize that we have no ability. We cannot. Apart from Him, we are nothing. Without Him, we cannot. In Him and only in Him alone can we live, can we move, and can we have our being. Amen. Okay, so understand this. That is what exchange is about. This is the meaning of victory I found. That the life of the Son of God, hallelujah, from now on, Christ's meekness becomes our meekness. I always answer that meekness is not about what? Weakness, huh? His holiness becomes my holiness. There's nothing I can work, I can add to make myself holy. You know, as I deliberate, I struggle with prayer life, but I begin to realize, God, I must make it that your prayer life becomes my prayer life instead of my trying to strive for it. His fellowship with God, I must learn to appropriate that, to obtain it to be my fellowship with God. I want to tell you something. 
as Jesus was tempted in every way and yet found without sin, I had to change my mindset that there's no temptation too great for me to overcome. That a victory is not about my trying. It's about my understanding who I am in Christ. Today, I'm not afraid anymore. I've learned God's principle. There are sometimes we've got to flee as well. Amen. <laughs> but the basic principle is, it's no longer I that liveth. I am crucified in Him. And Christ now lives in us. Okay? Next week, I'll talk more about the gift. How is a gift and not a reward? A gift you didn't work for, you don't deserve it. And there's no sin that's too great for Christ to overcome. And in that spirit of overcomer, we can walk in the victory. Why? Not because you can change yourself anymore. It's because of the great exchange. Amen. I can go on, but today I'll end early. They've been telling me that I always oversee to it. Amen. <laughs> so nothing else. Great exchange. It's a gift. Okay? It happens with a miracle that God can bring in life. I'll talk about it in the next two weeks. And you must understand this. It is not something you can attain. It's something you've got to learn to reach, obtain by receiving. Amen. Divine exchange. Exchange lives. Amen. 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 Okay, no more striving. Doesn't mean no more work, huh? <laughs> we still got to work. Amen. Don't, don't go around and tell your wife or your husband, ah, Pastor Francis didn't want to work anymore. I'm closing down the shop. I'm going to stay at home every day. No. <laughs> but it's how we can do work in that newness of life. There's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And it all happened because I am crucified in Christ. But yet, I got to learn to deny myself. Take up, not His cross, my cross. Do it daily and then follow after Jesus. Amen. Let's quiet our hearts now. Father, I thank you, Lord. That you have shown me how simple it is if we learn to rest in you. And that rest is not just about not doing anything. It's about a rest, Lord, to know that you are the one that has the plan. You are the one who paid the price. You are the one already that did the divine exchange, God. And God, it's time, Lord, we stop putting the eye back there. It's time that we need to stop striving. There's nothing we can do, Lord, to make things better. There's nothing we can do to add an iota to what you've already done in your work of redemption. Not even in initial sanctification you've done. Not even in the walk of righteousness, God. It's only you and you alone that's imparting it after you have imputed it. It's only you alone that, Lord, want to enable us, strengthen the walk in that newness of life. That we can be that overcomer. In that model you've shown us, God. Resting in you. Walking in you. Stop striving. Get the eye out. It's not about what I want. It's about understanding your heart, Lord. And understanding that I can do all things through you, God, who strengthens me. So God, to you be the glory right now. And I thank you, Lord. Right now, let your spirit lie over each one. Let us stop striving. Let us stop trying to attain. Let us stop understanding, Lord, this, that you have done it all. And God, we thank you again as we close this time. As we carry the remembrance of the divine exchange and the exchanged life that you already given to us. So to you be all glory, all honor, all power right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.